This calls to mind what Origen did, what Augustine did, what Ambrose did. They used the work of Plato in their theology. It speaks to me of what Thomas Aquinas did when he used the philosophy of Aristotle in his theology, when he used the work of the Jewish scholar Moses Maimonides. It calls to mind what Vatican II said, that there are rays of light, elements of truth in all the great religions of the world. Newman said, the church has the power of assimilation, like a healthy organism that's able to move into its environment, holding off what it must, but assimilating to itself what it can. So the church at its best down through the ages, drawing all that is good and true and beautiful into its own unity. The oneness of the church is not a crushing, totalitarian oneness. Rather, it is an assimilating and living unity. When, when the Catholics say Jesus is the one, the only one, it, um, folks say, how could you be, you know, how could you, you know, eliminate all these other religions or yeah. Indians who worship something else or, you know, the Muslims and all the rest. But we don't. That was the whole point of my talk at the Pantheon, was that because he is the Logos, all the other Logos, the, 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 the smaller um, expressions of God's truth can find relation to him. So we can find rays of light. We can find elements of truth in all the great religions. We can find elements of truth in all the great philosophies. We can look at every culture and say, that's good, that's good, that's true, that's right, that's just. And Christianity can assimilate all those things to itself. So it's not an aggressive move to say, he's the only one. It's actually a very inclusive move to say, as the logos, he's the one. But that includes everybody else. To a degree, they can all find relation to him. Well, the Muslims, I say, to a degree, in the opposite direction. Probably, yeah. But then, then we have to get down to you know, a really good argument. See, one thing that concerns me is we've forgotten how to have a good religious argument. The two options seem to be either bland toleration or violence. <laughs> and there is a middle ground between like, well, we're all doing we different things, so I'll let you in your ugly mind. But see, we don't believe that about politics. We have good arguments about politics. You know, if I'm a Democrat and you're a Republican, I want to convince you, I'll have a good argument with you. And the options aren't bland indifference or violence. We find a way to actually have an argument. I want to recover a way for religious people to have an argument. It's not just bland toleration. It's not killing each other. Look at Thomas Aquinas. He figured out how to do it. Thomas Aquinas argues very effectively with a whole range, Jews, Muslims, pagans, non-believers, everybody. That's the model. <laughs> Okay, I've been having a very civil argument with a young youth pastor on Thursdays, every other Thursday at uh, the Metro. And he was coming to St. Teresa and sitting in the back listening to Mass. And Mary Ellen tried to get him to ring the bell and he said, I'm not Catholic, I can't ring anything. <laughs> and. Uh, I introduced myself and he introduced himself. We started some emails back and forth. Well, now we're meeting face to face and he wants to know a lot more about the Catholic Church and he wants me to know a lot more about Protestantism, which I spent 62 years <laughs> studying. But we're having a great time. And we don't agree on a lot at this point. A couple of things that came up and he let me pick the subject last time we met. I picked the Eucharist. And wow, what a time we had. And one of the things that he was not aware of is first of all, when we eat the body of Christ, we're not eating the body of Christ dying on the cross. We're eating the resurrected body of Christ. And he said, I've never heard that before. He said, well, I, well I'm not going to eat dead flesh. I'm going to eat the living body of Christ. Then he said, well, I think you cheapen it by making it so physical. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Where'd you hear that? He said, well, I, you, you say this is the body and the blood and you make it so physical, the spiritual. You, you need to be transcendent. I said, 
wow, you need to read Scott Hahn's The Lamb's Book, you know, The Lamb's Supper, and, and realize that every time we go to, and I'm, here I am in Metro, getting a little louder, my hands are going up like this, got people staring at me. I said, every time we go to Mass, we are caught up into heaven. We transcend. Time collapses. And when I did that, a lot of people went, what is going on over there? Yeah. I said, time collapses. And we're caught up with the worship going on in heaven. We don't diminish it. We transcend it. I said, wow, I never heard that before either. Good job, Tom. <laughs> so then... Uh, then he said, okay, I get to pick next time. I said, all right. So it's this Thursday, this coming Thursday. And he wants to do solo scripture. Oh, boy. <laughs> Here we go. Scripture only. Yes. That's not biblical. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where does the Bible say the Bible only? It doesn't. I can't wait for it. Thur Thursday mornings are just a, a real extra joy for me now. And I, I love this kid. I mean, I didn't leave anything behind in the Protestant of the world. I brought it with me. Everything that I truly loved about being a Protestant, I brought it with me. But I keep telling him, listen, you're reading the menu, and the Catholics are eating the meal. And that's the difference. There's a fullness to the faith that I really wish someday you would understand and enjoy. And he appreciates that. He knows I'm passionate. I think that's why he's hanging out with an old guy like me. <clears throat> okay, let's turn our attentions to the mystical body of Christ. By the way, I love seeing you guys every Sunday morning. This is a joy to be able to gather together, hear incredible teaching in the video. He goes all over the world. I mean, in one moment you're in Paris, and the next moment you're in Krakow. Poland, and the next moment you're in New York, and the body of Christ around the world. It's beautiful. So he, <clears throat> he picks this wonderful topic, the mystical body of Christ. And right out of the box, he got my attention pointing out that in our creed, we say out loud in every Mass that we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And, and he brings up a good question. Why would we put that in a creed where we say we believe in God the Father, God the Son? I mean, what's this that we would bring in a human institution and, and put it in the same creed with God? He was saying that must be almost blasphemous. And he caught my attention right there. And I, I kind of went, yeah, why do we do that? But then he pointed out, we are not just a human institution. We are the living, breathing body of Christ. And there's something very mystical about that. And first of all, I wonder, why would God do this? Why would God limit himself to get things done on the earth through us? Because guess what? If we screw it up, you've heard people say, the only Jesus people will see today is you. And how many know sometimes we don't really portray a very good Jesus? But this is an amazing teaching. <clears throat> Here's where I really, he got me really going. If we ask, and I, and I think this is true, it, you, maybe you'll back me up on this. If you're to ask most Catholics, do you realize you are the true body of Christ? I'm thinking many would not know what you're talking about. And others might acknowledge that they heard that. But question, what does that really mean? Is that what you would think as well? I think a lot of Catholics would say, yeah, I've heard that I'm the body, or we're, we're the body. But what does that mean to me? How does that affect my day-to-day -day life? Why is that important to me in my culture, in my family? What does that mean? Then he takes us to, again, 
It's the church in Rome. We did not get to see this one, did we, darling? San Clemente? But it has this incredible, it's a half dome, and it's this incredible cross. Jesus is on it, and there's 12 doves. What does that represent? Apostles. 12 apostles, and they're doves. Why would they be doves? They would spread the good news of the gospel, right? But then coming out of that cross, right at the base of the cross, you see all these curly, curly vines. And this life is spreading out and upward and everywhere. And if you look in the detail, it's amazing. You can look this up on the internet, by the way. And just put in uh, the cross of San Clemente in, uh, in Rome, and this will come up. And then zero in on all these amazing things that are growing. Bishop gravitates to saying that we are the cells, molecules, and organs of Jesus' body. A living, breathing body on this earth. And the Bible gives us many, many pictures of this from sacred scripture. And this is one of my favorite, the one he used as well. Abide in me, John 15, 4, 5. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do not so much. What's it say? Oh. Nothing. Nothing. So if the last couple days we haven't been hanging with Jesus, guess what? <clears throat> not a lot happening. That's about as organic as, as it gets, but then it gets even more extreme. We can say, eat my body and drink. How many know eat my body and drink my blood is a lot more organic than I am the vine and you're the branches. Now we're getting into nitty gritty stuff. And he used this example, and it really brought it home to me, how radical the Catholic faith is. It's radical. He said, you can be admirers of Abraham Lincoln, and you can like the man and even become part of the society for Abraham Lincoln, but have you ever heard of anybody eating the body of Lincoln and drinking his blood? No. But that's what we say about Jesus. No wonder the Roman Empire thought we were cannibals. We need to understand this and be able to share it with the world in such a way that we entice them without repulsing them. And Chris and I are having a great time on Thursday. If you want to come in, this is quite a little show. It's coming in the back. What time? About 9 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. One of my, my old... Uh, What's his last name? Chris? Chris? <clears throat> I have to look it up now. I know him as Christopher right now. And I have his email. How many know digital stuff has messed up a lot of things in our memory? <laughs> I just know Chris at <laughs> gmail.com. <laughs> Such a neat kid. He's married and wow, just a lot of things. We are the body of Christ. His blood courses through our veins. And we have the mind of Christ because he's the head of the body. How many know if the head is removed from the body, the body has a problem? That's called beheading. So we're the body, he's the head. His thoughts, his thoughts can become our thoughts. If we live separate from him, we have no blood and we lose our mind. Does that sound radical? Yeah, 
It does. Which is why we never, 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 never want the enemy to separate us from the love of God. Yes. Uh, we hear so much about the zombie apocalypse and you know various things on. If a zombie is the living dead, look around the church. See how many zombies there are. <laughs> They're trying to live separate from Christ. Yeah. A good amount of our Catholic brethren right now are walking dead. Because they've separated themselves from the church. And the blood of Christ is not helping them in any way. The life is in the blood. And they've separated from the blood. And they have no godly thoughts because the head has been separated from them as part of the body. How many know if you cut out the liver and put it on your kitchen table, the body's going to suffer and so is that liver on your kitchen table? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. It's got to be in the body. Wow. Here's a really interesting scripture for me. 1 Corinthians 2.16 for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we, this is St. Paul, but we have the mind of Christ. Jesus said there will come a day where I will be in you and you will be in me. If we are in him, we're connected to the mind of Christ. And here we go. The next scripture really shows us that we are in the body. And he used Matthew 25. Remember this? I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we do this? When did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you? And when did we see you sick in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Same thing happened on, on the, the conversion of Saul as he went to Damascus. Who are you, Lord? And he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he was killing Christians. Because they were part of the body of Christ. And Jesus said, if you're killing them, you're killing me. Strong, strong stuff. Wow. In the same way that your body has to get up and move and do things today, the body of Christ has to do things that Jesus wants to accomplish today. What does that mean for you and me as the arms and legs and eyes of the body of Christ? Reality sets in right here when we say, I didn't do anything for Jesus today. I didn't even know He wanted to do anything through me today. How many know that's a problem? That's a problem. Can you imagine Jesus getting up and not doing what God the Father wanted him to do that day. Organic is organic. Another day connected to the sap life of the vine as we are the branches. I love that picture, don't you? Isn't that cool? God, he goes on then to say, we have to understand that as the body of Christ, God is a gatherer. He gathers to himself. The devil, and I have to make up, made up this word, is a scatterer, which I don't think is a word. But that's what the devil does. Satan wants to separate us, to divide us, to isolate us from the rest of the body of Christ. Eventually, to separate us from Christ himself. We've seen this with our loved ones. We don't see them for a mass or two or three or four. And then we don't see them for weeks and then months. And it doesn't take very long that they're questioning their faith altogether. And what has the devil done? He separated them. Isolated them. And then he went after them. God gathered his people to himself. 
First through Father Abraham and the 12 tribes of Israel. Then through Moses and then through David. God wanted to gather the entire world through the nation of Israel. Israel was not supposed to be put up on a pedestal saying, look at us, we're the chosen of God. No, God never chose them just to give them a great big halo. He chose them so that they would be a magnet to gather the whole world. And they didn't do it. And they got cut off from God. When they broke that covenant, they got cut off. And there was a new Israel form. And a new leader of that new Israel. His name was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he gathered 12 apostles, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And the new Israel was given new marching orders. You go out. You preach the gospel. You baptize them. You gather them into me. And that's us. That's you and me. Wow. Then he said this. And it really shows our purpose on this earth. And I, when I am lifted up from this earth, I will draw all men to me. Don't you love that picture? You get that feeling when Jesus is lifted up. He's drawing all through the cross of all things. And then His resurrection. And then His ascension. And then Pentecost. And all of us. We got marching orders, guys. And you can say, well, I've, I've got kind of a corn on my foot. Well, get it off. Hallelujah. We got to march on. Uh -huh. We got to march on. Jesus was and is the resurrected King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the leader of the new Israel, the church that he established <laughs> and commanded to go to the whole world and gather them in. What the old Israel failed to do We've been now tasked to complete as the new Israel. And then he talks about the Greek word used for church, ecclesia, ecclesia. It means to call out from, which raises three really important questions about the body of Christ and the church. First of all, who's doing the calling? Second, what are we being called out from? And third, then why are we being, what are we being called into? And you and I know the first, the answer to the first question, God does the calling. People don't just come to the church. God had to call and prod and push and pull Jackie and Tim for almost 10 years until we answered his call. We didn't just wake up someday and, hey, why don't we just be Catholic today? It was a fight. And he was calling us the whole time. Hey, Timbo, wake up! There's more to me than you've ever dreamed of. And it's in the Catholic Church. And then we have to be, what are we called out from? So God calls us. He's calling us out of a world. And thank God He is. Because it's dark out there, and it's ugly out there, and it's getting worser and worser out there. And we're called out from it. And where are we called into? The church. And he used this wonderful image of Notre Dame Cathedral. If you see it from the side, it does have these buttresses coming up to support the sides of the church. Where those long windows are, they needed to have extra support because they lost the structure of those walls when they put in those huge windows. But they look like oars of a big ship that's sailing down the river Seine and taking the gospel to the whole world. Wow. I had to put this one in. Keep praying for those guys to get that church that cathedral restored again. Tim? Yes. Um, I was listening to Relevant Radio and the guy, Patrick, um, 
Anyway, he was saying that we need to really be aware when they rebuild that because the Muslims want, they have the money and they want their uh, symbol where the steeple was. And he said, you know, this sounds crazy, but in this day and age, you know, so we need to really be aware and and yeah, be careful, especially for funding uh, websites, because there's a lot of falsity already going on out there concerning Notre Dame. So you have to be careful. I, I would only give to organizations you absolutely know are the ones that are valid. Yes. Some of the designs they have presented, it's weird. I mean, it's like the weird. Yeah, I think... But this is Notre Dame. I am convinced. Yeah, the the Lord will restore it the way it needs to be restored. So, and he compared the church to the ark and Noah. Noah gathered his family, all the animals, to save them from utter destruction. But eventually, he led them out of the ark to spread new life to the whole world. Jesus gathered all of us into the church, an ark for our safety and our nurturing. But we're not supposed to hide out here. No, 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 no. How many know if you just keep smelling animal stuff, that's not real. We need to get out there. Let them clean out the stalls. We gotta go. Wow. And then this, oh my gosh. John Paul II. Saint Pope John Paul II now. He turned to the life of a young Carol Watia. Man, it took me 20 minutes to find his last name on the internet. I spelled it wrong 38 times. <laughs> Carol Watia, Tiwa of Poland, who began his religious studies, isn't the timing of God? He started his studies the very day that the Nazis attacked and it decapitated Polish society. They killed or imprisoned the brightest of the bright. Uh, Bishop Barron calls them the intelligentsia of that entire <coughs> nation. Carol Watiwa went underground and continued to study to become a priest. After the war, the communists took over and a new kind of persecution took power. <clears throat> now Father Watiwa, he continued to do what he could do to build the church, working with several Catholics at a time. Realizing this, that God was in control behind the scenes and somehow God would set this generation of Polish Catholics free. But can you imagine how God are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? We had to suffer the Nazis and now we have to suffer the communists and the Soviets. God, how are you going to do this? Wow. It reminds me in some ways of very similar to what the early Christians had to do during the early days of the church under the persecution of the Roman Empire. How could Father Watila have known? Look at this picture. This is in Krakow. And he's the brand new Pope. And the communists, the communist leadership of Poland had a real mind cramp and they let him do this. And all those Catholics that he had been teaching for all those years, this was the moment in time. You hear the Bible say, in the fullness of time. Then, look at this. This is the fullness of time. God is about to take down the Soviets. God is about to take down the Iron Curtain. God is about to take down communism through a pope and the President of the United States of America, who was an actor in California, Ronald Reagan. Wow. 
body of Christ. God working behind the scenes and underground. Three hundred killed in Sri Lanka. Can we still believe in God? Is He still in control? Is He working behind the scenes? Is He going to get this thing done? I love that picture. I could look at that for hours. Look at him. Carol Matiwa. Supreme leader and successor to Peter. Uh, he would become Archbishop of Poland and finally Pope John Paul II, successor to Peter. Like Noah, Pope John Paul II hunkered down and he waited upon God for exactly the right time for the flood waters to recede and then he obeyed God and he spread that new life to a world imprisoned behind the Iron Curtain. Carol Watiwa could not have known that he would someday be the supreme leader and pastor of the Roman Catholic Church and be linked in a special way with the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. History clearly tells us that these two were instrumental in bringing down the Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain, and the evil of communism. The last part of this video, and we got just enough time to get through this. Laid out, he talked about the four marks of the church. The church is one, holy, catholic, apostolic. But we're going to end today's class talking about the first one, which is the church is one. First and foremost, we need to understand how dangerous it was to declare in that time to the whole world that God was one. Today it's pretty normal. What's the major religions? The Jews, the Muslims, right? And the Christians, and they all believe in one God. Yeah, I see it, Don. Thank you. The ancient Roman Empire was a pagan empire. They made room for lots of gods. But declaring one God, and then saying that one God was not Caesar, could get you crucified. And it did. For a lot of them. Next we see bishops standing in the Pantheon in Rome. Jackie and I got an opportunity to go into this place. That is always open. There, there's no window. There's no skylight there. That's just open all the time. But this place is amazing. And it's called the Pantheon because it was temple to the gods. Well, guess what it is now? St. Mary of the Martyrs. It's a church assimilated into Christianity. Yeah, this is a nice round building. I think we can use this. Praise God. And that's what the church does. It seeks out truth wherever it is in every culture and assimilates it into herself. <coughs> Wow. It takes your breath away when you stand there. It's the most beautiful thing. He thinks it's one of the most beautiful covered places in the world. And he stood there in that one place and related the pantheon to the oneness of the Catholic Church. He immediately began to talk about Origen, St. Augustine, St. Ambrose did when they assimilated the teachings of Plato. Oh, wow. This got, <laughs> there's some Protestants really upset about this still today. How dare you bring Plato into Catholic theology? Well, guess what? Everywhere truth is, it had to come from God first. It had to come from Jesus first. Didn't it? If Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, then whatever truth has been spread out there had to come from him. So if Plato picked up some of it, well, bless God. We can assimilate it, that into our theology. He also said that about St. Thomas Aquinas. 
and the teaching of Aristotle. The church has always had the genius and willingness to assimilate truth wherever we found it in cultures around the world. Not to compromise the faith. Big difference. Assimilate truth. But that means we rejected certain things out of those cultures as well. As Catholics, we're not afraid to acknowledge that all the great religions of the world have some truth. And down through the ages, the Catholic Church would find those bits of truth everywhere where they evangelized. Mexico was evangelized in 10 years. Millions came in in 10 years. And guess what? We kept some of their faith. They still do the Day of the Dead. That pre, that's prehistorical to the evangelization of Christianity in Mexico. Did you know that? They always had a Day of the Dead. But now they understand it through Jesus and His church. They still have the Day of the Dead. I've never seen any of you look like this. Not our culture. It is theirs. But they also had human sacrifice. Guess what? That didn't make it into the church. But by assimilating the things that we could, we were able to bring many cultures into the church in a beautiful, beautiful way. I thought I'd end with this. Isn't that kind of cool? This is different cultures' idea of what marriage looks like. Amazing. So what'd you learn today? We got two minutes. <laughs> Keep it short. Trish, what'd you learn today? one with God and God is one with her. It's very hard to for me to have the right words to say to her. Yeah, that's not an easy thing to, to really deal with. You need to ask God for wisdom and when there's an opening that looks like it's a valid opening and it's, it's also buttered really well with love. <laughs> yeah. But we need to, see, we, we can't just give up on those guys. I mean, we just hit. They, don't have, they have some truth, but they don't have the truth. So we need to love them where they're at, but boy, move them in the right direction if, you, if God gives you any opportunity at all. Katie, what'd you learn this morning? Like so many people think of the Catholic Church as like, like banning all other churches and traditions. So judgmental and so, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. The opposite of that. Yeah, and that doesn't mean there weren't some real atrocities that happened in the history of the church. I mean, the Spaniards did some terrible things to the Aztecs and the... It was bad. But there were some good things as well, so... Praise God. Okay, so we, she is one, but we haven't done she is holy, she is Catholic, she's apostolic. So that's what we're going to do next week. It was great to have you all here. Not one of you slept this morning. I, I think that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Bob, your beard is looking pretty good, buddy. Praise God. He's looking more distinguished every day. And the Mushroom King is out on Facebook today. So if you're out on Facebook and you want to look at 500,000 mushrooms, that guy right there found it. So, awesome, awesome. Let's pray our prayer. Can we do that? And then we'll get on being the body of Christ this week. If we don't get it done, that means Jesus wasn't able to get it done. So keep thinking about that. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you are God. We praise you. You are the Lord. We acclaim you. 
You are the eternal Father. All creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim, sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of the prophets praise you. The white army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you, Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not spurn the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at the right hand, God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people. Bought with the price of your own blood, bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Can't wait to see you next week. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes. You what? Yes. Praise God. Thank you.